Hello and welcome to the complete story of World of Final Fantasy Maxima. Probably the cutest Final Fantasy game you'll ever play. <laughs> I mean, you can't really beat this. A game filled with loving homages to classic Final Fantasy games, and miniature chibi versions of all your favorite Final Fantasy characters. Or at least a lot of them. But the game isn't all chocobos and rainbows, since the story is sprinkled with plenty of mystery, with layers of dark undertones, and more lore than a game like this has any business having. But anyway, I'm Peter from Birds of Play, and I hope you'll join us as we revisit the complete story of World of Final Fantasy, including the postscript DLC. It's gonna take a while until we can reclaim all of our memories, but I hope you'll stay with us every step of the way. Prologue. Awake at last. A young boy awakens along with his twin sister atop a lofty tower, both of them equipped with a single armored glove, emitting an eerie light. One yellow, the other blue. Together they walk to the very edge of the tower as if in a daze, the city of nine wood hills still sleeping silently below. As a mysterious girl tells them it's time to wake up, they both fall off the edge of the tower plummeting to the ground below. The boy awakens in his room with a strange fox-like creature riding atop his head, his clock reminding him that he's late for work. He hurries to the small cafe he part-times at, the strange creature coming along for the ride. As the boy arrives, he is surprised to find a customer already inside and lounging about at a table near the back especially since there doesn't seem to be anybody around that could have opened the cafe in its place. After serving her up a cup of coffee and watching her fill it up with an absurd amount of sugar cubes, the boy proceeds to get the rest of the cafe ready for the day ahead. Suddenly, his peaceful morning is shattered when his sister, Rain, bursts through the door shouting his name, Lan. Having finally found him, she drags him outside by force and tells him that something is wrong, pointing out that there isn't a single person walking around, and that the city has become a ghost town. The customer steps out of the cafe, cup in hand, and introduces herself as Anna Crow. Rain asks Anna why there is nobody around, and she retorts by saying that it has always been like this, that this has always been a world without time, one that ended when it began. She tells the twins that she has been checking in on them on a regular basis, but that until now, they had been nothing but blank stares. Now that they have awakened, however, Anna believes that it's story time. So she introduces the creature stacked upon Lan's head as Tama, leaving them in the creature's care. Once back inside the cafe, Tama explains that Rain and Lan are mirage keepers, and that the marks on their arms are proof that they possess a special power, the ability to control creatures known as mirages which are powerful living illusions. Tama tells them that they used to command a whole legion of mirages, powerful enough to rule over all the world. Tama then re-educates them on how to entrap mirages in prismariums, claiming them for their own and making them work their will. Afterwards, Anna Crow returns, telling them they have been stripped of all the memories they had associated with mirages, along with all the mirages they had once commanded. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel, as Anna Crow leads them to a mystical gate in Silver Park, a communal area close to the cafe. She tells them that beyond the gate's light lies another world called Grimoire, where Ren and Lan might be able to recover their mirages, possibly even recovering their memories. At the very least, they should be able to uncover clues about their past and the things they've done by finding traces and records of their past in the world of Grimoire. If they keep gathering mirages, they might even meet their family in due time, although Rain and Lan can't seem to remember them. Much still remains a mystery, but the twins answer the call to adventure, guided by Anna Crow and with Tama in tow. Passing through the gate, they journey to a new world, Grimoire, the land of mirages. Chapter 1. Land of the Lilikin Rain and Lan arrive in the world of Grimoire, only to discover they look very, very different, having been transformed into miniature versions of themselves, making them more similar to the residents of the strange new world. Thanks to Anna Crow, 
they are now able to switch between their Lilikin form, which allows them to pass as inhabitants of Grimoire, and their original full-size form, which in this world makes them into towering beings known as giants. Without a moment's hesitation, they immediately set out to collect mirages and recover their lost memories. But as they explore the wellspring woods, they happen upon a strange crack in reality known as a murk rift. Ever eager, the twins enter the rift. They are confronted by a powerful enemy they cannot hope to defeat and are soon at death's door. Only to be rescued by the noble Tama, who sacrifices one of her many lives to rewind time and return them to Ninewood Hills. There, they run into Anna Crow once again, who informs them of a visitor to their empty world whom they might want to pay a visit to. In the shopping district, the twins meet a cheerful young woman by the name of Chocolati. Somewhat overwhelmed by her aggressive salesmanship, the two agree to stop by her establishment whenever they need to do some shopping. As Rain and Lan prepare to return to Grimoire and resume their quest to collect mirages, Tama bumps into an old friend, the Wind Pixie, Seraphie, who has been tasked by Anna Crow with helping the twins manage their Prismarium collection. After a brief chat with Seraphie, Rain and Lan continue on to the gate in Silver Park, where Anna Crow is waiting for them. She tells them it is time for her to bid Nine Woods Hills farewell leaving the rest in their hands. The twins protest her sudden departure, but faced with their barrage of questions, Anna Crow merely smiles. As she disappears in a flash of light, she tells them who she is. God. Rain and Lan are certainly shaken by this strange turn of events, but for now, they have little choice but to resume their quest. They return to Grimoire and begin looking for a way out of the woods. Chapter 2 Foretold by Prophecy On the other side of the forest is a vast plain, dotted with lakes that sparkle in the sun. Rain and Lan take a minute to drink in the beauty of the world that awaits them before once again setting forth into the unknown. Further along, the twins hear the sound of a whistle slice through the air as an oddly shaped train pulls up to the nearby station. Rain and Lan hop aboard, where they are greeted by the gregarious mirage who operates the train, the Cactua Conductor. Then, once the matter of tickets is resolved, the train sets off, carrying them along for the ride. Ahead of them looms a wondrous sight, the city of Cornelia, a town that appears to have been built upwards by piling buildings upon building in a stack that reaches into the sky. Rain and Lan stroll through Cornelia, taking in the sights and sounds of the city. But the peace is soon broken by panicked screams. A host of mirages have attacked the city, each of them an infantryman in the employ of the Bahamutian army. The twins quickly dispose of the invaders, but Lan forgets himself and returns to giant size for all to see. The townsfolk gasp in shock and tension fills the air. From the ranks of the onlookers, a woman steps forth. Quickly discerning that Rain and Lan are not from Grimoire, she invites them to Castle Cornelia to hear their tale. Rain and Lan enter the throne room of Castle Cornelia, only to find that the woman they met in town is none other than Cornelia's ruler, Princess Sarah. A good ruler is always gracious, so Princess Sarah thanks the twins for saving her city before getting down to business. She tells the twins that they are, without a doubt, the giants from the hills, spoken of in prophecy, foretelling that they are destined to alter the course of Grimorian history, bringing it either salvation or ruin. Rain begins to ponder the implications of the prophecy, but there are more pressing concerns at hand. The Bahamutian army will soon be at Cornelia's gates, and the twins have agreed to help them turn them back. But first, they need to head to the Nether Nebula to capture more mirages, furthering their power to bolster the city's defenses. Chapter 3 Old Acquaintances Deep within the heart of the Nether Nebula, Rain and Lan encounter Ifrit, Shiva, and Ramu, powerful mirages who seem to have some sort of history with the twins, although they have of course forgotten them. To prove their strength, the twins agree to do battle with one of the three mirages as a test of their strength emerging victorious in battle. But seeing as they still lack the power to command such powerful mirages, 
Their chosen opponent instead leaves them a lesser prismarium, belonging to its tribe, and disappears to parts unknown. Having acquired newfound strength, Ren and Lan dutifully return to Cornelia to face the Bahamutian army. Chapter 4 A Legendary Warrior Having returned to Cornelia, Ren and Lan discover that the Bahamutian army has set up a camp near the city, and Lan comes up with a courageous plan to cut off the head of the beast. The twins head into the Watch Plains, behind enemy lines, where they hope to circle around the main force and strike at the Bahamutian commander from behind. Once there, Lan and Rain find Princess Sarah bravely leading her troops into the thick of battle. The princess shoots them a wry smile, but is suddenly ambushed by a giant goblin that has risen from the cliffs behind her. However, just as it brings its fist down to crush her, the brigade captain of Cornelia gallantly leaps into her rescue, saving her just in the nick of time. Just as all hope seems lost, the brigade captain's body glows with a strange light as the power of the twins floods into him. At that moment, he is awakened as one of Cornelia's legendary heroes, a warrior of light. Rain and Lan hurry to his aid, and together they send the remaining Bahamutian troops running. Removing the enemy leader's helmet, they are shocked to find that their enemy isn't human at all. The leader of the army instead being a mirage. Unsure of what this could mean, the twins return to Cornelia. Meanwhile, dark forces have begun to shift in the shadows, the time they have awaited having finally arrived. Their leader, a draconian knight in black armor, announces that time has resumed its march and tasks Sagorides, the knight in the golden mask, to begin carrying out their plan. A woman in a cage asks the remaining knight, the plumed knight, whether they won't waver in their duties. The plumed retorting that they have a prophecy to fulfill. Chapter 5 The Champion Who Saved Grimoire With the Bahamutian army defeated, peace has returned to the kingdom of Cornelia. However, they must remain vigilant. Another attack could come at any moment. To strengthen Cornelia's defenses, Princess Sarah and the Warrior of Light propose to make contact with the anti-federation organization known as the League of S. Seeing as they've already come this far, and could use some sort of direction as they round up new mirages, Rain and Lan offer to act as Princess Sarah's emissaries. With her letter in hand, they depart for the northern country of Saronia, whose fate is rumored to be in contact with the League. Along the way, Rain and Lan enter a mystical wood known as Pyroglow Forest. By a lake in the heart of the wood, Rain and Lan happen upon the summoner Yuna, performing a ritual in the middle of the lake. Yuna mistakes the twins for the Bahamutian army's heralds and attacks. Soon, however, she realizes the power they hold resembles that of the great Lucifana, and so she asks the twins who they are. Rain and Lan recall that their mother's name was also Lucifana, and beg Yuna to tell them everything she knows about her. Yuna agrees to share what little has survived in legend. She tells them that a hundred years ago, Grimoire was on the brink of destruction at the hands of the demon Dyad. When all seemed lost, a hero stepped forth, Lady Lucifana. Summoning three heralds from another world, she stopped the demon Dyad. But soon after her victory, she disappeared, and none have seen her since. The herald she summoned, however, remained in Grimoire and founded the Bahamutian Federation, their influence spreading across the world. Lan grows impatient, failing to see how a story from a hundred years ago could have any connection to their mother. However, Rain, ever the sensible one, reminds him that their memories are vague and unreliable. Yuna reveals that Saronia has recently joined the Federation. Although this puts a damper on their plans, the twins decide to continue on with the slim hope Saronia and its Thane can still shed some light on the League of S. Chapter 6 Solace from the Ice A vast snowscape of silver and white awaits rain and land on the far side of Pyroglow Forest. Huddling against the cold, they hurry to a nearby inn. Once inside, Rain and Lan meet the proprietor, a young lady named Charlotta, who seems wise and experienced beyond her age. The twins look for something to ward off the elements while treating themselves to a well-deserved rest. 
Sherlotta gives the twins the Warlock's Warmer, a magical item that can protect them from the harsh cold. Accompanied by their new friend Refia, they then set out for Sharonia. The party enters Icicle Ridge, the gaping valley that stands between them and Saronia. There they search for an exit while keeping a watchful eye out for the dangerous mirages set to hunt the ridge. Harried by attacks from a pack of white knacks, the party decides to put an end to this game of knack and mouse by taking down the pack's leader. They gave chase, only to find themselves outwitted by the creature. After barely managing to subdue the pack of angry beasts that surrounded them, the party eagerly bids the ridge farewell. Chapter 7 The Thane and the Knave With Icicle Ridge behind them, the party finally arrives in Saronia. The twins part ways with Refia and prepare to meet with the Thane. Along the way, they decide to gather some information from the locals. Rain and Lan learn from the townsfolk that a great social and economic divide has appeared between those who accept the Federation and those who do not. Although Saronia's annexation to the Federation was recent, the differences between these two classes of people is already readily apparent. Suddenly they discover a mysterious door appearing out of nowhere, and once they pass through it, they enter a mysterious tea room, occupied by a girl who has forgotten her name. The girl welcomes them and tells them that they are keepers who have come to touch the souls of their friends, their past, present, and future, allowing them to come to the aid of those who have awakened as champions in their time of need. Leaving the tea room behind for now, Rain and Lan continue on to see the Thane of Saronia. However, at the entrance of the Thane's manor, twins find Refia arguing heatedly with the guards, who have refused to allow her to visit the Thane, her own uncle. The twins present Princess Sarah's letter and manage to escort Refia past the protesting guards. However, their audience with the Thane takes a sour turn when they realize Refia's uncle has been replaced by some sort of Bahamutian soldier in disguise. Although the three manage to defeat this false Thane, he quickly rises as if immortal. What happens next shocks them all the more, as the sinister masked figure emerges from the shadow and fells the Thane with a single bolt of piercing light. The figure, Sacarides, is incredibly powerful, and most certainly not a friend. As he advances inexorably on Rain, Lan, and Refia, salvation arrives in the most unexpected of forms, a cat. With a flash of powerful magic, the cat buys the beleaguered party the moment they need to escape. It turns out their knight in furry armor was Sherlotta, who had been shadowing them in cat form to make sure they didn't get into any trouble. After fleeing to the outskirts of Saronia, Sherlotta hands Rain and Lan some magical monocles and insists they use them to re-examine the town. The lenses reveal a colossal anchor driven straight into the heart of Saronia. Attached to the anchor is a vast chain that rises into the distant heavens. Sherlotta explains that every town and city the Federation has annexed is bound by these visible chains. In all the confusion, Rain and Lan have forgotten to gather any information on the League of S, but they cheer up when Sherlotta tells them that she has a friend who can get in touch with the League. Having left the rest of the diplomacy in Sherlotta's capable hands, Rain and Lan resume their mirage collecting journey. Their next destination, the Low Seas. Chapter 8 Buccaneer Blues Rain and Lan decide to ask around town for someone willing to lend them a boat and help them reach the low seas. But alas, no one is able to help. Realizing they cannot get a boat through the legal channels, the twins consider skirting the law a bit. Rumor has it there is a pirate ship at the docks, and they rationalize to themselves that it's not really stealing if it's from a pirate, right? After making their way through the perilous docks, Rain and Lan manage to find the pirate ship thereafter. They sneak on board to borrow it, but run afoul of its Mughal crew and the fiery-eyed Captain Ferris. The twins have failed to gain the upper hand, and to make matters worse, Saronius Thane has caught up with them. Things are looking grim. But the twins' bacon is saved when Ferris and her sea dragon friend, Sildra, send the Thane packing with a powerful strike. Rain and Lan explain to Ferris the events that led them there, and in return, Ferris and her crew offer up some juicy info. 
According to the prophecy, the giant on the hills are destined to find four keys and ascend the crystal tower. One of these keys lies at the bottom of a valley of fire, on a continent bordering the low seas. Now that Ran and Lan know for sure they must go there, they ask Faris for any help she can provide. Chapter 9 The Low Seas Faris introduces the twins to Quistis, who has traveled to Saronia to donate a ship to the Thane. The Thane's monstrous turn, however, is enough to convince Quistis to donate the ship to Rain and Lan instead. Rain and Lan hover aboard their new fast craft and set off downriver toward the low sea. At first, the miles meander by pleasantly, but as the current picks up and the far-off roar of water draws closer, they realize they are in trouble. Over the towering waterfall they go as their boat plummets for what feels like a terrifying eternity. Rain, Lan, and Tama find themselves washed up on a rocky shore, their boat beyond hope of repair. They soggily set out in search of some other mode of transportation. The twins find a small turtle being picked on by some mean mirages and rush to its rescue. After driving off its tormentors, they then release the turtle back into the sea, and moments later, a gargantuan adamantois rises from the briny depths. It seems the little turtle has a big friend. To thank Rain and Lan for rescuing this kin, the adamantois offers to ferry them across the low seas. The twins graciously accept his offer, climb onto a shell, and continue their journey. As the twins are minding their own business, a young woman bursts out of the ocean and clambers aboard the adamantois. She tells them that her name is Riku, and that she's a treasure hunter. Riku takes a breather from what has been a long swim, and joins the group on their way to the Babel region. Chapter 10 Too Warm a Welcome the Adamantois safely deposits Rain and Lan on Babel's rainbow shore, and he and Riku bid the duo farewell. Rain and Lan need information on the Valley of Fire they're looking for, so they head off in search of a town. Beyond the rainbow shore lies a rocky, precipitous, and altogether hostile ravine. Keeping an eye out for dangerous mirages, the twins travel through the stony scar, hoping to find a town on the other side. Waiting for them in the ravine is not one, but two great big hungry dragons. Taken by surprise, it looks like they are about to become lunch. Just in the nick of time, a young woman by the name of Tifa, wielding the power of a champion, leaps to their rescue. After she leaves, Ren and Lan travel north, reaching the town of Nibelheim, their journey being overseen by nefarious onlookers. Ren and Lan reunite with Tifa in Nibelheim, when she learns that the twins are the giants of the hills spoken of in prophecy and that they are looking for the keys, she offers to introduce them to a summoner who is researching the valley where one of the keys may be hidden. Tifa introduces Rain and Lan to the summoner, Rydia. The twins are startled to learn that there are, in fact, two prophecies. The original Azure prophecy, written by the first summoner, and a newer Crimson prophecy that she believes is poisoning the minds of Grimoire's people. Rydia has been researching these prophecies, and Rain and Lan couldn't have come at a better time. She agrees to guide the twins to the Valley of Fire, where they can find this key, Valley Seven. The party arrives at Valley Seven, a violent maelstrom of orange flame. The air is choking, dense with a sweltering heat. But Lan and Rain remain undeterred. They continue deeper into the valley, searching for the key of prophecy. A wall of fire blocks the party's path, and Rydia lets out a shriek of terror and dashes off. Surprised by this strange and sudden outburst, Rain and Lan set off in pursuit. The twins catch up with Rydia, just in time to save her from some mirages. Rydia confesses that she has a paralyzing fear of flame, but Rain and Lan, ever their silly selves, manage to cheer her up and calm her down. The twins insist she not push herself, and so she agrees to return to Nippelheim once her work there is done. Cloaked in the light of a champion, Rydia extinguishes the blazing wall that has been blocking their path. Her strength spent, Rydia then retreats to Nippelheim. Meanwhile, the twins head deeper into the valley, searching for the key. In the heart of Valley 7, the twins find the glowing key, 
But as they reach out to claim it, a king bomb bursts onto the scene, swallowing their prize whole. The twins battle with the king bomb and emerge victorious. But there is no time to celebrate their victory as a massive mirage appears out of nowhere, bringing with it a massive tidal wave. Unable to fight the relentless pull of the water, the twins find themselves washed away to parts unknown. Above them, the plumed knight quietly watches all of this unfold, all the while holding the unconscious Rydia. Chapter 12 Ribbit Jiggle Panic Rain and Lan again find themselves all washed up, this time on the shores of a vast swamp. First things first, they decide to take a look around and try to regain their bearings. The twins don't have to travel far before they encounter a strange toad. But the toad is no toad at all. It's a person, the victim of a toad curse, it seems. In order to thwart this mortification, they must find and capture a golden toad and force it to undo the curse. Rain and Lan have never turned down an amphibian in need before, and they don't plan on starting now. Lan captures the lucky toad, and with it, the twins revert Snow back to his human form. Snow was originally on his way to lay down the hurt on a mirage living in the swamp. The twins agree to help but kick the big jiggle, and off they go into the muck. The party manages to find its target as a giant, gelatinous, quivering ball of golden flan rises out of the swamp, engaging them in battle. After a good number of thumps and thwacks, the flan decides it's had enough. The party has won. For now, anyway. Snow guides the twins to the swamp, freezing them a path over the wetland. Once they reach relatively drier ground, Snow says his goodbyes and races off. Chapter 13 Castle in the Desert Soon the wetlands give way to desert, a vast, vast expanse that stretches far out over the horizon. Taking Thomas' sage advice, Rain and Lan stop by a nearby caravan for a short rest. There the twins meet a kind merchant who gives them some sunblock to help them beat the heat. Rain and Lan plan their next move, and decide to continue in search for keys or any mirages that might be around for the taking. They learn, in fact, that there are mirages making their home close by, in the gritty recesses of the Phantom Sands. There, Rain and Lan are attacked by monstrous sandworms roaming the desert, and after somehow managing to fend them off, thinking they are safe, another sandworm bursts out of the ground. The hapless pair are frozen in surprise as the deadly adversary hurtles toward them. Luckily, lightning leaps to their aid, a glow with the noble light of a champion swiftly striking down the sandworm. Grateful to be rescued, Rain and Lan accompany lightning to a refuge deeper in the phantom sands. As they rest, Rain and Lan regale lightning with the story of their journey thus far. A passing merchant overhears them and joins the conversation, informing them of a lost passage of the prophecy which holds clues to the location of the keys. The key of earth, in the cradle of Mako's light, still lies. The key of tides, to the temple in the deep it fell. The key of shadows, in the land of naught but night it dwells. Where the four keys gather, the way to the crystal tower will open. Atop the tower live the heralds in a mighty castle, or so the prophecy says. With a promising lead to their mother's location in hand, the twins nod off to a peaceful slumber. The next morning, however, they are roused by a thunderous roar as a gigantic castle, bound by a great chain and anchor, rises from the sands. The drinks they had last night were spiced with more than cinnamon, and the twins find themselves barely able to stand. The plumed knight appears and casts some sort of spell on the two. When the twins try to fight back, an unbearable pain lances through their arms, and they lose consciousness. Chapter 14 Lost Powers Rain and Lan wake to a quiet grey darkness. They are in some sort of ruins, although both of them appear to be unharmed. The pain in their arms does not abate it. Grimacing, they take a look around. A ragged man crouches dejectedly in the corner of the room. He tells them, that they have been taken to a prison, and that all who try to escape are hunted down by deadly, sentient machines. Unable to summon mirages and cut off from Tama, Rain and Lan are in deep trouble. Their only hope of escape 
is to somehow avoid the mechanical guardians while searching for a way out. However, they are soon caught red-handed by patrolling Magitek armor. Without mirages, the chances of fighting it off are paper thin. Suddenly, a figure leaps out of the darkness, finishing off the Magitek armor in the twinkling of an eye. The young man turns and introduces himself to the twins, his name being Squall. Squall gives the twins an Eld Box, an item that allows them to capture machines the same way they capture mirages. Adding the Magitek armor to their collection, Ren and Lan then follow Squall deeper into the underground prison. Squall explains he is on a mission to dislodge the anchor chaining Figaro Castle to the Federation, and that if they can activate Mako Reactor Zero, which lies somewhere in this underground facility, might provide just enough horsepower to yank them free of the chain. There is one little hiccup though, the surrounding area is crawling with mirages. Figaro's king, Edgar, feigned allegiance to the Federation to sneak Ren and Lan into the prison to deal with exactly this problem. The party finds itself cornered by another Magitek armor patrol. Squall shouts at Ren and Lan to go on without him while he keeps the enemy at bay. Although they don't want to leave Squall alone to face so many foes, they realize that without mirages, they will only get in his way. The two flee the scene, hoping that Squall makes the two safely. Chapter 15 the Marco Reactor and the Black Mages. At the entrance to Marco Reactor Zero, Ren and Lan meet a woman they think is the other agent. But the moment she catches sight of them, she lunges at them, weapon in hand. Unable to match her skill in battle, the twins have no choice but to try to summon their mirages. The pain is paralyzing, and yet the suppressors hold. Their attacker, Shelki, uses some kind of strange power just as the two pass out. When Rain and Lan open their eyes, the first thing they see is a joyous little ball of fur. It's Tama! The twins' Mirage Keeper powers have returned. Tama explains that Shulki used her counter-attack ability to remove the suppressors. The twins are ready to return the favor, so they and Shulki head deeper into the ruins in search of the reactor. Once they get it up and running, Figaro will finally have its freedom. <laughs> The party locates Marco Reactor Zero, but ranks upon ranks of strange mirages stand guard around it. Ran and Lan fight their way past the Legion of Foes. To their surprise, one of the mirages they fight speaks to them and introduces himself as Vivi. It turns out Vivi is quite the friendliest sort, and he convinces the other mirages to stop fighting and start fixing. With their help, Marco Reactor Zero is back up and running in no time. As the Marco energies begin to stir beneath the sands, Edgar stands ready. He gives the order, and his desert fortress charges forward. It strains, it shudders, it pulls against the chain. It trembles, it creaks, and then with a deafening crack, it snaps. With Figaro free at last, Rain and Lan are ready to move on. As a surprise bonus, Vivi produces the key of Earth from beneath his robes. Better yet, Edgar tells the twins where to look for the next key. On the other side of Big Bridge is a continent perpetually covered in darkness. Could this be the land of naught but night, where the key of shadows lies? Ren and Lan bid the desert adieu and journey west toward Big Bridge. Chapter 16 Clash on Big Bridge Ren and Lan arrive at the foot of the Big Bridge and meet its caretaker, the summoner Eiko. Eiko explains that the bridge is actually an enormous mirage, Alexander, and if they want to cross, he's going to have to wake it up. Rain and Lan get into position, and the moment Eiko rouses the sleeping Titan, the twins' platform rockets upwards at breakneck speed. After the terrified Rain, Lan and Tama zoom out of sight, Eiko turns to face another guest, the plumed knight. Completely unaware of the peril Eiko faces below, Rain and Lan come to a halt short of their destination. They will have to touch the rest of the way on foot. While climbing up Big Bridge, Rain and Lan meet Barthes and his chocobo pal Boko. Some kind of bizarro highwayman has been waylaying travelers on Big Bridge, howling Barthes' name as he attacks travelers. Barthes is there to find and put a stop to this troublemaker. The more the merrier, says Barthes, and decides to continue the climb with Rain and Lan. 
The end of Big Bridge is in sight, but a man descends from the sky to block the party's path. This strange man is named Gilgamesh, and he's the nuisance who has been blurting out Bart's name. A hundred years he has allegedly awaited this day, and charges our heroes intent to do battle. However, the party managed to send the sword loose for packing. In the end, they have no idea who he was or what he wanted. But there's not much else to do but shrug and move on. Rain and Lan part ways with Bart at the end of Big Bridge and head off into the land of Not But Night in search of a town. Chapter 17 Not But Nightmares Rain and Lan stroll across the moonlit land, eventually spotting the train. They make their way toward it, but this locomotive seems different from their usual ride. Rain approaches gingerly, but despite a heart-stopping scare from the ever-energetic Cactua conductor, they realize they are on the right train after all. The train chugs its way across the darkened land and drops Rain and Lan off within sight of some kind of dimly lit town. Hopefully, its residents can provide some clues as to where the next key might be. Ren and Lan are alarmed to find the town deadly quiet, and hooked by another one of the Federation's anchors. They keep their eyes out for danger as they creep their way through the strangely empty streets. After a short walk, they find someone, a woman crouched and sobbing by the side of the road. When Lan calls out to see what's wrong, she springs to her feet and wheels toward him, fangs bared. Soon another fanged man leaps from the alley, too surprised to react, Ren and Len are sitting ducks, but a young man, wielding a buster sword and spiky hair nearly as sharp, leaps to the rescue. The twins follow their rescuer, Cloud, deeper into town. Cloud recognizes Rain and Lan as the giants of the hills when they easily dispose of a group of mirages. He leads them to an ancient building further into town. Books upon books, lines seem out like endless ranks of shelves. As they take in the spectacle, the twins meet a woman, Celis, and a robot-like man, or is it a man-like robot, named Sid. Cloud, Celis, and Sid recount the troubles that have befallen Tome Town. First, the anchor appeared without warning. Then, before long, vampires were running amok and soon almost the entire town had turned. There's only one way to save Tome Town. You need to find and kill the vampire that started this whole mess. Rain and Lan agree to head to the train graveyard to slay this prime vampire, while the others do what they can to help the remaining townsfolk. Cloud takes Rain and Lan to the train graveyard, and they head in alone, keeping their eyes out for the prime. Rain and Lan find their path blocked by a phantom train, but they lock out and avoid an encounter this time. However, the Prime swoops in while their guard is down and kidnaps Rain. Lan heads deeper into the train graveyard to rescue his sister and put an end to the Prime. He finds Rain lying still on the cold ground. Lan rushes to her side and is relieved to find her seemingly unharmed. But before they have time to relax, the Prime once again descends on the darkness and attacks. No sooner have Ren and Lan defeated the creature than it springs back to life with nary a scratch. To make matters worse, Rain has been turned into a vampire. Things are looking mighty bad for Lan when Cloud arrives in the nick of time and tosses Lan a wooden stake. Lan catches it in mid-air before plunging it into the heart of the charging Prime. The vampire menace is over and Ren returns to her usual non-blood-sucking self. And what luck? They find the third key among the Prime's remains. Although their work here is done, Rain and Lan decide to head back to Tome Town one last time to check in with Celis and Sid. Sid tells the duo that the final key is likely on Besaid, the continent directly above them. Rain and Lan head out, bidding their Tome Town friends goodbye. Chapter 18 The Fell Spell and the Quacko Queen Rain and Lan discover a moonlit train station, but the tracks are cut, leading nowhere. The Cactua conductor pops out and tells the twins this train does indeed go to a continent above them. Confused as to how a trackless train goes anywhere, they nevertheless hop on board. The train is cleared for liftoff, and liftoff it does, 
straight up into the air, like a rocket. It plunges into the bottom of the ocean above them and keeps on swim chugging its way up. Rain and Lan splash out of the warm coastal waters of Besaid. Spotting a town nearby, they head on in to see what information they can gather about this underwater temple they're looking for. Sadly, no one seems to know how to get to the temple in the deep. Rain and Lan are just about ready to throw in the beach towel when they notice an odd little sign. Pantologist always here to assist, it reads. Well, it's a long shot, but they might as well check it out. Stepping into the pantologist's shop, they are confronted with a rather unique sort of individual, the dazzling master of magic, Shan Toto. Shan Toto casts one of her specialty curses over the unsuspecting duo, so they are able to breathe underwater. But the catch is, they can no longer breathe out of it. Shan Toto unceremoniously stuffs the gasping twins into barrels of water before handing them off to Titus, with instructions to take them to the sunken temple. Titus guides the twins to the sunken temple without further incident. Somewhere within its watery halls waits the Quacho Queen, which they will need to find to make her cough up a Quacho Ruby if they ever want to undo the curse. Rain and Lan track down the Quacho Queen inside the temple. She seems friendly enough at first, but then, the second she catches sight of Lan, she goes into a tizzy and attacks. The twins manage to deliver a suitable trouncing, and she flees sobbing. In her wake, she leaves a shining red jewel, the Quacho Ruby. Now all they need to find is the key. The twins venture further into the sunken temple, where they are treated to the site of all-out Quacho warfare. The Quacho's opponent, a massive Tonberry, sends the Quacho Queen flying before turning its deadly sights on Ren and Lan. After battling Ren and Lan, the Tonberry falls at last, and the twins get their hands on the final key. Trading the Quacho Ruby for the antidote, Rain and Lan can finally breathe on land again. But as they walk out of the surf and onto the turf, they find a huffing and puffing Yuna. Yuna's been looking for them. According to her, both Vidya and Aiko disappeared shortly after meeting Ren and Lan. She fears that someone is after the summoners. And speaking of the plumed devil, the plumed knight appears in a flurry of feathers and carries Yuna away. Titus jets after her, as do the twins, but they are no match for Yuna's feathered tormentor or Titus' speed, and they soon lose sight of both of them. Suddenly, the four keys emit a bright, blinding flash, and stairs made of light appear, leading into the heavens. Rain and Lan stare in wonder at the shining stairs, when a hooded woman appears from out of nowhere. The woman tells them that if they climb these stairs, they will find the crystal tower, and their mother, Lucifana. Then, without another word, she disappears. Lan is gung-ho and ready to get climbing, but Ren is worried about the strange woman's motives. Still, they don't really have any better options, so up they go. At the top of the stairs, Ren and Lan find a town that looks almost exactly like Nine Wood Hills. Ren and Lan glance about at the strange ruined buildings as they walk to the foot of the crystal tower. When they arrive, they find a young woman wearing a suit of magitech armor, Terra, blocking their path. Something seems wrong with Terra, but the twins don't have time to puzzle it out as she attacks them. They manage to knock the wild-eyed Terra out, and Rain wonders who she is and why she attacked them. Chances are that if she wakes up, she'll just attack them again, so the twins leave her and enter the tower. After Ren and Lan have left, the knight in the golden mask appears out of thin air. He stares in the direction the twins vanished, a slow smirk spreading across his face. The stairs inside the crystal tower seem to go on forever. Ren and Lan look up, sigh, and start trudging their way upward. On their way to the tower, Rain and Lan find a sealed gate, and after successfully unlocking it, they continue onwards and upwards. Chapter 20 The Crimson Prophecies End At the top of the crystal tower sits a man on a throne. Next to him lies a cage, a woman trapped inside. Rain and Lan move to save her, but the draconian man on the throne, Brandilis, will not let them have her without a fight. As they triumph over Brandilis, the hooded woman once again appears before them. 
If they activate the Ultima Gate, she says, they should be able to destroy the cage. Rain remembers that the hooded woman, Rain, who they once knew and thought of almost as kin, a sister. Rain places her trust in Hurin, and with Lan, they activate the Ultima Gate. The cage cracks and shatters, freeing the woman inside. But what is this? The woman in the cage was Hurin. But how can there be two of them? Wheeling around, the twins see the hooded woman, the woman they thought was Hurin, collapse into an empty heap of clothing. The beautiful room melts away, shifting to reveal an ugly, dirty place. The missing summoners, along with Terra, are bound around a warped hole carved out of the very stuff of reality. The knight in the golden mask and the plumed knight are there as well, looking pleased. From the darkness, an evil-looking gate appears. Out of this gate pours mirage after monstrous mirage. They smash a hole in the tower and fly out into grimoire beyond. Rain and Lan are frozen in surprise and confusion by the series of inexplicable events, but they are soon galvanized into action by the timely entrance of Titus, Squall, Lightning and Cloud. The reinforcements free the bound summoners, snapping the twins out of their stunned reverie. Together, they flee the Crystal Tower on a getaway airship waiting outside. Safe for now, Rain, Lan, the champions and the unconscious Hain all head to the floating island Balam Garden. Everyone gathers on Balam Garden's deck to discuss what's happened and what they're going to do about it. Shalki arrives with a report that the machine entities known as Cogna that escaped from the Crystal Tower have invaded every town, city and village of the Federation. Non-Federation towns are still fighting the mysterious invaders off, so the League of Asses' course is clear. They will do everything in their power to aid any bastions that remain. While waiting for her to regain consciousness, Rain and Lan decide to head to Ninewood Hills to see if they can locate the absent Tama. Back in Ninewood Hills, the twins and Seraphie rouse Tama from her sunked out state and get her to explain just what in the world is going on. According to Tama, the Cogna have but one purpose, to destroy not just Grimoire, but every world there is. As if this news wasn't bad enough, all of this is, in a way, all their fault. Deceived by Brandelis and the other X-9 Knights into following the Crimson Prophecy, the twins were the ones that opened the Ultima Gate and brought the Cogna to Grimoire. There is a big question plaguing the twins. How were they able to open the gate and summon the Cogna in the first place? They need answers, and the only one likely to have them is Hain, the only link they have to their forgotten past. Rain and Lan find Hearn on the deck of Balam Garden, recovered from her wounds. They approach, hoping to find answers, but are met with nothing but a furious scowl. Hearn is unable to forgive them for something they've done, whether they remember it or not. She tells them that the only things they are capable of bringing to this world is pain and chaos, before disappearing into the sky on her familiar. Christus arrives on the deck and asks the twins to lend their strength to the League of S in the fight against the Cogna threat. Chapter 21 Chaos in Grimoire With Seraphie's help, Rain and Lan are able to gather information on the Cogna threat to Grimoire. The gist of it is that things on Grimoire look very grim indeed. The twins will need to be in multiple places at the same time if they want to have any hope of stopping the Cogna. There's no way the twins can be everywhere at once. Unless, of course, they go visit the girl who has forgotten her name, enabling them to help their allies all across the world practically simultaneously. Rain and Lan hurry to the girl's chambers, hoping they'll be able to do some good. Using every advantage they can muster, Rain and Lan manage to help fend off Cogna attacks on every corner of Grimoire. When they return to their airship, they find a message waiting for them from Quistus, telling them, she has discovered where Brandilis and his lieutenants are hiding. He tells the twins to make their way to a nearby Federation town and the cathedral at its center. Inside the Federation Cathedral, Rain and Lan come face to face with a horrendous sight. Rows upon rows of people, their souls being ripped out of them. Shalki tells the twins the truth behind the Federation's inhuman system. The souls of architects who enter the cathedral are transformed into crystallized energy and transported to Brandelis's castle via the chains. 
the soulless bodies that remain are transformed into the Federation's mirages. Learning that only a giant is able to pass through the chains leading to Bahamut's castle, Rain and Lan pluck up their courage and declare that they will find Brandilis and put an end to this once and for all. Rain and Lan successfully navigate the chain road and reach the enemy stronghold Castle X9 rising ominously above them. High atop Castle X9, Rain and Lan find Hyrne and Siren engaged in a stalemate deathmatch with the plumed knight. With the arrival of the knight in the Golden Mask, however, Hyrne and Siren are overwhelmed. Wounded and beaten, they fall under the assault of the fearsome pair. Ren and Lan leap to Hyrne's aid. The battle is long and arduous, but eventually the twins stand victorious. At the very moment of their triumph, the twins remember the crimes they committed and the true identity of the knights. Everything is their fault. Rain and Lan, they were the ones who summoned Brundilis to Grimoire. Their parents, Luce and Rorik, gave their lives trying to protect them. By the time Brandilis was finished with them, Luce and Rorik were gone, their bodies possessed by the spirits of otherworldly knights. As the plumed knight is defeated, Luce, Ren and Lan's mother, regains control of her body. But the reunion does not last long. Brandilis arrives with a blast, and when the dust clears, Luce and Hune are gone. Blinded by rage, Rain and Lan charge Brandilis, hitting him with everything they have. He shrugs off all their attacks, unharmed, despite their valiant efforts to fell him. Left with no other option, Lan sacrifices himself to create a massive crystal cage. Inside, both he and Brandilis will remain trapped for all time. With her parents dead and Lan gone, Rain loses her very will to live. Hugging Tama close to her chest, she returns to Ninewood Hills, giving the story an unhappy ending. Postscript. Turn those corners up. Just as everything seems to be at its darkest, a large white fox mirage appears before Rain. You will not accept this, it asks. Rain shouting back that no, she will not, for who could? The white mirage nodding solemnly. In the blink of an eye, Ren is back at the cathedral, an excited-looking Lan and Seraphie at her side. However, when Ren asks the two what happened to Tama, she is met with nothing but puzzlement. Ren comes to the realization that Tama spent all of her many lives to rewind time, sacrificing herself to give them a second chance. Lan insists on climbing the chain road, but Ren refuses to budge. She has seen their fate. Even if they defeat Brandilis, it will change nothing. Ren asks Seraphie to find Hyun, and the twins set off for Balam Garden. Ren and Lan reunite with Hyun. They tell her everything that they remembered and what they plan on doing about it. Brandilis and his knights created the Crimson Prophecy to deceive the twins into restoring the Ultimate Gate's connection with another world. Manipulating the power of the captured summoners, Brandilis summoned the Cogna through the reopened gate and into Grimoire. Now that the Cogna are here, simply destroying the gate or defeating Brandilis won't stop them. But Ren has an idea. If they all work together, they can yet save Grimoire. First, Ren and Lan will use their power to once again open the ultimate gate. But this time, it won't go from there to here, but from here to there. Once the gate is opened and reversed, the summoners will use their combined power to pull all of the Cogna out of Grimoire and send them back through the gate whence they came. If this plan is to work, Ren and Lan will need all the summoners' help, including Hyun. Hyun looks them squarely in the eye, weighing the strength of their resolve and the trueness of their repentance. After a long, long moment, she nods. Ren and Lan know that for their plan to stand any chance of success, they need to become not just strong enough to open and reverse the gate, but to fight Brandilis on equal footing as well. They set out, intent on finding powerful mirages and claiming their power for their own. Once powerful enough, the time has finally come to set the plan into motion. Ren and Lan reconfigure the ultimate gate, while the summoners prepare the reverse summoning. Meanwhile, Brandilis has noticed that something strange is happening. He moves to investigate, but is stopped by the combined strength of Cloud, Lightning, Squall and Titus. While he faces off against the four heroes, 
He orders his lieutenants to hurry to the Ultima Gate. The two knights arrive. Quickly grasping the gravity of the situation, they leap toward the helpless summoners, intent on stopping them. But Rain and Lan stand in their path. Rain and Lan defeat the knight in the golden mask, the plumed knight, and the plumed knight's final form. Although dying, Luz and Rorik ever so briefly return to their former selves. Watching their parents fade away from their very eyes, Ren and Lan burst into tears. Lucer gazes happily at her children. Smile, she tells them. Ren and Lan do their best to wipe away their tears and give their dying mother one last smile. The summoner's ritual is still incomplete when a new threat steps leisurely into the room. Randilis, the Bahamut king, has come. Knowing that this will truly be their last battle, Ren and Lan step forward to face him. Randilis seems invincible. No matter how much damage they inflict, he merely shakes it off, as if it were nothing. Desperately, Lan creates a crystal cage around their fearsome foe, but his power starts running wild. Ren adds her strength to her brothers, stabilizing him, and together they manage to imprison the still struggling Brandilis. Moments later, the ritual is finally complete. An enormous swirling mass of energy appears, creating an irresistible pull that sucks Cognaf every corner of Rimor back into the Ultima Gate. Brandilis' cage edges closer to the portal, until suddenly, with a great clash, he bursts from his crystalline prison. Rain and Lan do not hesitate. They leap atop him, fighting tooth and nail to push him out of their world. He resists to the last, but the twins' valiant efforts finally prove his undoing. Their victory does not come without a cost. Rain and Lan are too close to the portal. There is no coming back. They fling their prismariums to Hoen, entrusting the future of Grimoire to her. Smiling, they disappear into the swirling depths of the Ultima Gate. The battle has been won, but Grimoire is still in turmoil. The champions scatter, each heading to a different corner of the world, still having their work cut out for them. Soon, only Hyun remains, gazing quietly at the spot where Ren and Lan vanished. As she turns to leave, she hears a small sound from behind her. Glancing back, she sees two small prismariums, left to her by Anna Crow, gleaming in the warm light of the sun. And so ends the complete story of the world of Final Fantasy, Maxima. We hope you enjoyed our retelling of the game, and that you make sure to subscribe to the channel for more. But until next time, kaka, we're birds. <laughs> That's the gimmick. <laughs>